Hello and welcome to this CUBE conversation here in our Palo Alto studios. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We've got a great conversation here with entrepreneur, founder and CEO of Articulate, CUBE alumni who was just on theCUBE at our SuperCloud 4 event talking about the, the cloud and AI with Intel. Now he's the founder and CEO of Articulate, a hot new company that was launched, formerly from Intel intellectual property, assigned to a startup and funded by Intel and Digital Bridge, Arun Sabrinian, who's here. Um, Arun, great to have you coming on theCUBE and uh, congratulations on your new venture. John, thank you so much for having me here again. <laughs> it's, it's nice to be here. interested as a founder, entrepreneurial, <laughs> entrepreneur, <laughs> founder, because just recently you were at Intel as, an, right. as a big company guy. That's right. Formerly Amazon Web Services. Uh, and again, you're on theCUBE with SuperCloud and you kind of knew this was happening. And kind of <laughs> kind of smiling all the time. I knew something was <laughs> up with you. I mean, uh, thanks for coming on. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. And it's uh, been uh, quite an exciting time. We launched on January 3rd officially. Yeah. And uh, yeah. um, it's been uh, quite an interesting reception yeah. uh, both at, uh, right after the launch and CES yeah. as well. You know, it's really an exciting time, Arun. You had one of the most prolific comments that Dave and I have been repeating from SuperCloud about thought experiment. If, you know, if AGI was here, it would know we know it, therefore it's not here. Um, it's really an exciting time for, for businesses mm -hmm. and, and entrepreneurs with yes. this AI wave coming yeah. because it really is impacting up and down the stack. Super cloud, you got super chips, yeah. the middleware is changing. You've seen AI ops, I just did a conversation uh, recently with a VC, former um, uh, executive around how AI ops is going to change, how software gets built and how infrastructure is going to be run. And That's with right. the skills gaps, we're going to see a lot more yeah. self-driving infrastructure, if you will, with AI. Totally. And then the paradigms are shifting. You're starting to see things flip. Um, you need infrastructure to run the apps. Now apps is the data, data needs it. So yes. you're seeing a new paradigm, not just on the trends, but in the architecture. And I think the enterprise specifically right. is most disrupted. This is what you guys are doing. Explain Articulate's premise. Describe the transaction. Okay. Intel has this IP that you started. Take us through the story. Absolutely, so we started this um, not necessarily trying to go build a platform, right? So we started this because uh, even inside Intel, uh, to go help solve customers' problems, right? And and uh, the problem that we were trying to solve was, how do you get Gen AI into enterprises safely and at scale? And enable enterprises to move really, really quickly so they can build applications fast, right? So that is really the problem we were trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Now when we got into it, it was pretty obvious that you not only have to go enable them to say, build a large model mm -hmm. or deploy one model at a time, you actually had to help them go from the bottommost layer of the stack, which is the infrastructure layer, move up to the data layer that takes care of all of the different data elements required for your Gen AI engine, and then get to the model layer that we think about. It's not just a model, it's a collection of models. And not only our premise, our whole thesis that we've now validated multiple times over is, a model is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. You need to have multiple models working together. We actually call yeah. that model mesh. That's our most proprietary technology <laughs> that uh, we've launched with. And then it is really around giving customers ready to use application level APIs. What I mean by that is, if you ask a question, say take a simple question, like say you want to be able to search for something. Now just that search alone, you go into it, has to hit like 15 different APIs, come or collect all of that, Yep. and then give application developers something for them to use. Think of all of the different complexities that has to go through all these four layers, vertically optimize it, that's really what we do. So you're an enterprise software company, okay, yes. so, in t so, you, so I'll get to the business model in yes. a second, but you're targeting the, the AI market, application builders who have a lot of data sitting around, yes. they want to essentially get up and running, you're a, a shortcut, a fast path to Absolutely. getting applications running with data. So yes. data is the source. You build the software, training, fine tuning, inference, all built into the platform. Yes. It's a platform, right? That's right. And I deploy it on premise, so my developers can code with the data. Is that uh, right? So that's absolutely right. The only addition I'll make to that is on premise for us is both on-prem, like so an actual on-prem data center, or the cloud, right? So, but even in the cloud, we run entirely inside the customer security perimeter, right? So what I mean by that is, say if you're running on Amazon, we deploy into your VPC, right? Which is uh, slightly different from most other players because we are both a SaaS provider. You talked about the business models, we'll get into it. We are a, a SaaS based business model, mm -hmm. but then we are kind of an on-prem deployment model. That's one side of the story. The other side is when we say we deploy, 
we actually enable our customers to deploy VMware hands-on keyboard deploying into your environments because that also can get intrusive with respect to security, right? So, and um, we had to do take this hard step up front because mm -hmm. that's where we started with, <laughs> right? Most of the customers we're dealing with are Fortune okay. 1000 companies. Okay, so tell me the market opportunity. What market are you targeting? So, I'll give you um, a, a lay of the landscape, right? So, I mentioned this briefly the last time I was here in Cube as well. Think of the biggest and best models that are out there. Any model that's out there that you want to name has been trained on the open public data set that's out there. Less than 5% of the world's data. The 95% of the world's data that is dark, that's our opportunity. And not only that the data is dark, it's going to continue to stay dark. No enterprise is going to go put that out <laughs> there for somebody else to build models with. But not only that, think of the last decade where the amount of money that's been spent in data and AI transformation activities, mm -hmm. depending on who, whichever report you believe, whether it's McKinsey or BCG or Bain or anybody else's report or IDC, it's a universal consensus that between eight to 11% of those projects have actually gotten to the outcome they promised initially. Flip side of that is 90% haven't gotten to production. Yeah. The finally, we have a piece of technology that can actually get maybe 50, 60, 70% of those projects to production. That's the opportunity that we are going after. And it's also not something where you go and hire an army of data scientists, an army of, uh, say, consultants, and then wait for three years before you get an outcome. What's the alternative? Okay, I'm an enterprise server. I think there's a lot more opportunity. I think the, the beachhead is enterprises who yes. want to get into AI business. Yes. So their alternative is to build code from scratch. So build code from scratch, or imagine going after 100 or uh, 500 different options, trying to figure out which pieces actually fit together, trying to understand which models are good. Somebody tells you you need a large model, somebody tells yeah. you you need a small model. It, but then today the conversation is predominantly around models because they are the coolest thing. Yeah. But the problem is they're maybe 10, 20, 30% of the solution. Mm -hmm. 70% of the solution is actually going and figuring out how do you close the last mile yeah. into the delivery gap, which nobody tells you, and then yeah. you get into it and realize that you have two years and millions of dollars spent before you can get your first outcome. So we're getting into the, the dark data, you mentioned the enterprise, say the yeah. enterprise out there has all this data. It's a vendor, they have their own proprietary, not proprietary, but it's their yeah. data, they speak vendor. Yes. That's their company language. So then you got, um, you have information that's their information. Yes. Then you got information that people know about yes. in the market. Yes. Customers, third party, third and then party. you got analysts. Yes. What? How do you guys train that data? What's What's the, uh, you're training it on, Think of. Uh, are they training it themselves on their own data, or do they have to in mesh with other data sets to cross train? Very good question. So let me like talk in three uh, buckets, right? So think of it as the open world data set that's already out on the internet. That is the world knowledge data. So in one way, shape, or form, you need some way to get that information. Most of those models out there, either you get a proprietary mm -hmm. model or you get a model of your own, you can have that. And the reason why some companies would- Proprietary, you mean like OpenAI? Like OpenAI or any of the other companies that are out there, right? The large so language, the big ones. The big ones. Yeah. Or you can do open source models and then fine tune it for yourself, right? So that's your own model. The reason I say large companies will need something like that is the regulatory landscape that's evolving you need to have more and more control over what you put into your own environments, what you can actually deliver to your customers. That's one bucket. Yeah. The second bucket that's only now basically nascently evolving is what I call domain-specific models. So the model that understands that particular domain, right? So it might still be from open information or nearly open information. So we have the cube model. We, we know we speak cube. B2B tech, <laughs> jargon, Kubernetes. So that's the domain model for Cube. Yes, right, so like for example, everything related to infrastructure, everything related to cloud, yeah. that would be the Cube specific model. And then, but that's also Cube industry specific model. Mm -hmm. Then you get into actual Cube model, which is your own proprietary data, your yeah. interviews, your back-end conversations, the team, the team that actually puts yeah. this show together. That information also needs to get codified into a model for you to then go and say, look, I will be able to go deliver. No, we could use this, we're a big customer. Absolutely. So I think you have a lot of markers. I think there's going to be a surprise, be interesting as we progress through the journey, what emerges as opportunistic white space yes. that you didn't see. Yes. Someone becomes a data aggregator overnight, uses your software to kind of create a new paradigm. In fact, uh, that paradigm. I'm smiling because uh, that's kind of already starting to happen. <laughs> right? So we uh, were in stealth for a long time, partly because we were also very careful about saying, look, we need to be able to deploy this in production, mm -hmm. have customers ready to be able to talk about it before we can actually go, say, launch that this is actually real. We've done that in multiple verticals, right? So uh, you can see that on our website as well. 
but really one of the largest financial services firms, yeah. not only took our platform and deployed internally, they actually went to production with their applications over the holidays. Right, that's something. So that really fast. Very fast, right? So one of the biggest advantages is, we say we don't do POCs, we do only production pilots. <laughs> the difference is scale, yeah. right? The reason for that is, it's super easy for anybody today to go do a demo with a few hundred documents or a few thousand documents. Yeah. Anybody can go do that. But jumping from that to, uh, say, tens of thousands of documents or hundreds of thousands of documents or millions of documents, completely different ballgame. Yeah. Our production pilot starts from there, right? So I'll give you some simple metrics, right? Take uh, the latest uh, demos that anybody shows uh, in their own, um, uh, say, conferences, cloud conferences. They're dealing with millions of tokens, right? That's the, the demos that are being shown. Our production pilots at a bare minimum are 10 to 20 billion tokens. That's the production pilot. And that's deployed in six to eight weeks. So you have headroom. You got scale headroom, no problem on, no problem. on the future. future. Future proofing, you think? Yes. Uh, well, so we the, think that this people. is getting, yeah, so for enterprises to get in, the reason why you need to go to that kind of scale is any enterprise of reasonable size would have these kinds of volumes before they can start giving meaningful answers, right? So that's the main, main important thing. All right, so let's get into the business side of things, yeah. just to get the, on the record here. So Intel, had the IP, you were incubating it, you're doing all this cool stuff. That's right. You realize, hey, you know, we can build software to help accelerate people's journey. Yes. Um, Pat loves it. They are, they're all looking at this, hey, there's an opportunity. Yes. So you guys, spin out's a weird word because it's got all kinds of corporate, Intel's a big conglomerate, is, right. what's Intel's relationship? So just to get it right, let me get the facts right and you tell me if it's right or not. You have intellectual property that was assigned to a new company that you're the founder and CEO of because you incubated That's it. Right. Intel signs the intellectual property so to let it go, Yes. and they get equity for that, and they give cash investment. So, uh, is that, so help me, take me through the transaction real so, quick. So, uh, first of all, the premise of the transaction, right? Let me just give you a little bit of the premise. Because, so the, the field is moving so fast, and also the need from enterprises is massive, right? So everybody wants to go get this done because that they're seeing yeah. that as a core differentiation. However, we also have to meet customers where they are, mm -hmm. and this is a software uh, play first and foremost. Now it will have a massive pull through effect for all hardware manufacturers, including Intel, but we have to be cognizant that customers will have to be the ones making the choice. Of course, we'll, we are optimized on Intel, we'll continue to stay optimized on Intel, but we are also hardware agnostic and we are cloud agnostic. That's one of the selling points. So that's the premise of the story. Now if that is true, and we're also going and deploying yeah. to customers already up front, we're already optimizing across the board for customers, right? Now, the IP that the software was built in Intel, but then Intel being an investor, transitioned the IPO to the new company. The new company is completely independent. Mm -hmm. We, um, in some ways, are, uh, have to own our own destiny moving forward. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Welcome to the party. Yeah. So, so Intel doesn't really have an, it's not an, it's not, a, it's not a, they're not, it's not a company, Intel company, it's completely independent. It's a completely independent. Digital Bridge is another company that put money in, so you have another investor. That's right. So you have a board of directors, yes. it's a startup, yes. you got funding. Yes, now we actually have several investors that we've named publicly, some investors we've not named publicly, so for example, uh, FinVC, Fin Capital, yeah. or uh, GS Holdings, or uh, Communitas Capital, lots yeah. of the investors came together, yeah. but, and it's a completely independent company run like a venture-backed company. The Cube Capital never got a phone call. I mean, <laughs> next time, and keep us in mind. Um, yes. Great to have you on SuperCloud. And again, this is exciting news. So I want to get back into the um, business model. Okay, business transaction, that makes total sense. Congratulations, you're an entrepreneur. Welcome to the, you're out in the wild. Um, get a fend for yourself. <laughs> yeah. You got a friend here in the Cube. We like it, what you're you. doing. Um, how do you make money? What's the business model? What's your thinking around yes. how you're going to deploy this consumption, yes. how it's deployed? how customers engage with the software, how you, what you charge for, take us through the economics. Absolutely, right, so this is, um, from the business standpoint, it's a SaaS business model. And what I mean by that is it's really a subscription-based business model. And we offer what we call two different bundles, right? So the first bundle is what we would call Express Bundle, which really gets people quickly started yeah. and then go off and scale. And this also aligns with our overall philosophy that look, if somebody tells you that the only way for you to get into Gen AI with transformation is you have to go build your model, I think you'll have to rethink who you're getting your advice from because there's three steps. You think that's bad advice? Getting some, build your own model, what does that mean? What does that even mean? Yeah, so build your own model, I would say, is the third step in a very long three-step journey. And the reason for that is, first and foremost, you have a lot of data. Can you first 
figure out what you can do with the data if you had a Gen AI engine with you. So there is probably about 70% of your use cases that doesn't even require a fine tuning or a full blown free training yet. You can tackle a significant amount of use cases there, right there. Now, most other of your competitors would also be able to do that. They have their own data, they can go do that with any number of different uh, off the shelf uh, components to go do it. The next step is okay, there are some use cases I cannot solve just by using my data with an existing set of models. That's when I go start fine tuning for specific tasks. I'll get to maybe the next 20% of use cases. The last 10% of truly differentiated use cases are the ones where you need to pre-train. Now, you cannot jump to that step directly. You need to be methodical about how you go there. Mm -hmm. And the other piece is you need to be able to get business value as you are moving there. It's not a, and by the way, moving from the first step to the third step, every time you probably jump order of magnitude in terms of how much investment you need to make. Yeah. So you need, if you're getting 10X return, you need to know what you're going and applying it for. Yeah, and so let's get into some of the tech and the secret sauce, because I think you, you're the good transition point there. It's not trivial, I mean, it's kind of trivial, but not trivial to actually make something work at a model basis. Yeah. You got to take a lot of steps, there's a lot of things yes. to do. And it's like a sausage factory, it can get ugly, it gets dirty. So I guess the question I have is, is that, what are people doing now? Because I, I see that same thing. And you mentioned model meshing. Um, one of the things the Cube Research put out was the power law of how you see specialty models coming out. Yes. My thesis I've been putting out there for, for over a year now is that model integration will be a big part of, okay, model mashups, I call it. That's so right. Remember the old web 2.0 mashups? Yes. Um, I see models integrating with each other is that what you mean by mesh, or mesh as in a neural network mesh? Or, so, I, mean, I mean, it's so think explain of, the uh, mesh, mesh concept. Absolutely, right, so we, uh, so it's uh, model mesh itself is one, as one word is our trademark, but really what um, we mean by model mesh is it's a collection of models, some of them are LLMs, some of them are not LLMs, and then there is a decision layer on top of it that decides what to do based on the inputs that are coming in mm -hmm. and also based on the reactions from the customers, right? So it's that dynamic system that has to decide what to do. And the reason you need that is the same person even asking the same question out of the same data set, the same corpus, might want different answers at different points in time mm -hmm. because their context has changed. Mm -hmm. and. Assuming that one large mega model would somehow be able to answer all these questions is, uh, in my opinion, a pipe dream, right? So you need to be able to collect different pieces. Mm. The other one is any vertical that you go into, if you're solving the hardest problems, not the simple problems that everybody seems to be tackling, but the hardest yeah. problems, you also cannot ignore that particular domain. So I'll give you a specific example, right? So take uh, financial services, for example. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to go do, uh, say, uh, even actuarial models you need an LLM or a set of LLMs to go understand unstructured information coming in, combine that with structured data, but then you also have to make sure that the existing models that are validated, verified over decades, don't get forgotten. Now, if we try to go build yet another model for it, first of all, it's never going to catch up with existing models. Second, it's a waste of time. Why can't we merge the two worlds together? Yeah. Then you actually increase your confidence, increase your pace, and can get the advantages without losing the accuracy. Does that solve the hallucination problem? Absolutely. Or makes it more higher quality? It, is, it definitely makes it more higher quality, but the hallucination problem is uh, acute when you try to do everything with a model. When you start putting guardrails with multiple models, when you start putting guardrails with checks and balances, the problem kind of automatically goes away because you're grounding it with data, and then whatever output comes out, you're again grounding it with existing models. Okay, so let's take, what's the secret sauce? So if I understand this correctly, I have data, I got cube data, I got all this data, I drop it into Articulate yes. platform, yes. and then I can start building apps. Yes. How does that work? Take us through the secret sauce. Well, what's the secret sauce of that software? And then how does that deploy? How do I get apps out quick? What do I do? Is it a language? Is it a framework? So, so the, the beauty of this one is uh, the language and the framework is all as standard as it gets. So whatever application language, uh, application programming language you're using, you continue to use that. The, you interact with the platform purely through APIs. Most of those APIs are as standard as it gets, right? So it's a, a standard REST call or a standard GraphQL call, and you're just basically building your application mm -hmm. on top of it. We take care of actually deploying the product into your environment. We also give you tools to make sure that the data pipelines that are needed to come into the platform is all clean. However, I also want to be clean that 
every enterprise we go into also have their own data platforms. We are not here to replace your data platforms, it's purely connection. Like a Databricks, Data Lake, or Snowflake, any, or any whatever. Any of those, right, things, right? So the connections would automatically be made, so there is no... It's just really a data pipeline. It's a data pipeline with as minimal replication of data. And I want to be careful there, because mm -hmm. if you have a large amount of data sitting in a relational database, there's no reason for you to replicate it. <laughs> the only thing that'll come into an articulate platform is the metadata around what data you have, right? And that's something else that you asked about white space that's already evolving. Yeah. That's where it's also evolving. I'll come to that in a bit. But in terms of what customers have to do, it's about connecting the data in through our API so that the, the right amount of information comes in, but the connections back to your original data streams are intact. So we don't replicate mm -hmm. anything, right? And then everything you need for your application is automatically pre-configured and then delivered for you. Now, if you go to, I mentioned the Express Bundle, those are application-specific, domain-specific. The other end of the spectrum is what we call a premium bundle, where if you're a large enterprise, you want a platform for yourself where your people can go in and experiment, mm -hmm. deploy different models, try to figure things out by yourself also. Mm -hmm. That's the premium bundle where you can, we use the premium bundle to build that Express Bundle. <laughs> How much are they paying for this? What's the price? Our promise to our customers, and we've uh, stood true today, and that we think that we can actually do that over the long term, is today we are three to five times cheaper than any platform out there that if you have to go do it yourself. And this is the total cost, not just the software cost, but the software cost plus the people cost that you need to deploy the, the, the systems in place. Now, the three to five X delta is something that we have not just saying it for the sake of saying it. Yeah. We've done this multiple times where we've told our customers. Who are the competitors that are out there doing it? Accenture and some of the, the consultants, or is it more? So not really. So this one comparison is with OpenAI, with uh, say with uh, Google Vertex, or with uh, Jumpstart, Anthropic, Bedrock, uh, like uh, any one of those players. If you have to go do the same application, to build an application in production, the- So you're an alternative to Bedrock then? Absolutely, so so I would say Bedrock is more of an ingredient, to be honest, because yeah. that's the model layer, a piece in the model layer. So who's cooking the meal here? The developer, right? So if that's an ingredient, I'm, an, I'm thinking about you my have on to, premise. You have my to actually data. go do all the work, right? So you have to do the work on the infrastructure layer, you have to go do the work on the data layer, you also have to do the work on the API layer. All that is what we are taking away. Uh, to borrow Amazon's own terms, we take away the undifferentiated heavy lifting. <laughs> you like to borrow, <laughs> yeah, and, and you compete with Bedrock, and make it easier. I mean, look, I believe, in, and you know, we It's said also a partnership, right? So for example, yeah. we don't have a problem partnering with Bedrock where the model deployed in Bedrock actually yeah. gets deployed into it. That's not the problem there. Well, the problem that we're seeing in the market is production workloads aren't, yes. aren't yet in the cloud. They're still figuring out what am I, what do I got here. Yes. Some of the alpha developers are going fast and they're getting in there. We're seeing that. Uh, but to your point about um, this inflection point, we've been saying it. We said on SuperCloud. I keep saying it again from the shout, shouting from the highest mountain I could find that this is like the web. I mean, this is so early, and totally. that what's coming is more innovation. Absolutely. This white space is developing. Yes. You've introduced a new paradigm. To me, it reminds me of not to date myself, but it sounds like the old developer kits. Remember back in the old days, you know, you, you get a developer kit, yeah, and then you put, and all you put on your together. laptop and your, your actually PC laptops weren't even around. Then, no, no. But, you know, you'd I mean, code yeah. and then you'd ship it to a machine and you got an application. Yes. It's got middleware, it's got hardware. Yes. This sounds like it's a development kit for data and AI, is that? So, so think of it as am it's I, a, am I close? So you're very close. The difference is, so your analogy about, look, the world out there today is like a developer kit out there where everybody has to choose every little thing. It's great for somebody making choices for themselves to learn, but imagine an enterprise where they have to go to a production workload in eight weeks or 10 weeks, unimaginable for them to go do yeah. that. That's really what we're abstracting, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing also that's coming out of all of our conversations, certainly it's been great on theCUBE to kind of horizontally get the conversation space around AI nailed down, is the data is the new moat. Data is the competitive advantage, right. data is where the value is, and back to your point about dark data, implying that enterprise have all this data, it's not yet indexed, yes. and not necessarily they want to be indexed. They don't. You know, I, was, you know, I, mean, I see people saying, I want my own model. Yes. And okay, now I want to, maybe put a wall around that or firewall it or do something, bad word, but, but, but protect it, and then integrate it into other data to see. How you can actually build applications faster. And not only that, the notion of having just one model 
to uh, make sure that everything you do in your enterprise <laughs> is actually replicable <laughs> is also a little funny, uh -huh. right? Yeah. You need to be able to expand beyond the notion of just one model. It's like magic and chemistry. It's like the stu mad scientist dropping stuff into the mix and then you got you know, magicians prompt, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know yeah. waving your hand and magic's happening. So that speaks to that integration, integration. as you blend data. This is not, I mean, common. No. I mean, and data uh, alchemy has been around in some use cases, but with neural networks and now and now data is not at all common. highly available. That's not a conventional wisdom no. in the data management world. Not really. And also, what we call data is data in the traditional sense, and also institutional knowledge. Right? In a lot of sense, the institutional knowledge is not really captured properly. And think of this as a level playing field where you can capture unstructured institutional knowledge. Somebody's offhand comments come into the play. Mm -hmm. But then you can actually set, okay, this is coming in from a 30 year veteran. Yeah. Pay more attention to that. Yeah. And all of the structured information coming together, you can mix it together into your own unique company platform. It's interesting, um, our cube AI can actually go in and find out who's smarter. You, you or I mean, there's it's linguistic, it's content, it's data. Yes. I mean, to your point, I mean, this is this is this is the this is the to me the why I'm so excited about this is like one of the most exciting computer science business impact yes. waves yes. I've ever seen, That's right. and I've seen a lot. I mean, going back multiple generations of flexion points. But uh, I got to ask you, architecturally, we're covering things from KubeCon, which is cloud native, Amazon reInvent, all the cloud players now AI yes. and big data since Hadoop, and you know the Cube's 13 years. We've seen everything. This is about like, okay, the architecture is impacted now, and everyone out that I talk to is like, we got to re-architect our enterprise to support cloud dis distributed edge, because the data equation is changing, compute and now the infrastructure is changing, and yet there's not enough platform engineers out there, out there one, that's one. just on the infrastructure side, yeah. so there's a whole opportunity there. Yeah. And then on the LLM side, there's just not enough coders that can, can sling APIs and do RAG, uh, <laughs> retrieval augmentation generation, as well as actually figure out what to train. What, you know, so, what do I do with data? So data engineering is emerging as a huge issue. What's your take on this whole architecture, uh, changeover, how are companies dealing, how do you guys see these enterprises evolving, knowing that there's a developer market that's robust yeah. and the plumbing is all shifting? So I would say in one sense, the architecture is emerging, but not necessarily completely changing. And the other sense, we finally have a, a glue, think of it that way, that can actually connect the different disparate architectures that have evolved, right? So we've gone from the edge to the cloud, to data lakes, to data warehouses, to uh, lake houses. <laughs> and um, what I call, um, if you start putting data without thinking about yeah. what you're doing in lake, uh, data lakes or lake houses, you end up with data swamps, yeah. right? We actually have an opportunity to take advantage of all of that because finally you have a layer that understands unstructured data and structured data equally well. And the notion of, uh, I mentioned this in the CES talk before, yeah. there is some amount of fear saying, oh, this is going to replace developers and all that, but your point it's enabling developers. is enabling developers, yeah. and imagine the number of new developers we'll need to get all these applications yeah. deployed. I, I, think, I think your point about the data swamp has been around, yeah. that's been a cliche for years, yeah. right, about going back to the Hadoop Spark yes. transition, obviously Databricks is using that lake house and data swamp example. But think about the concepts. I've been using ChatGPT to clean up a bunch of old email lists. Yeah. Go out and take into all the Gmails yeah. and Proton email, and just it just does it like that. Yeah. I think that the swamp is, goes away with AI because you say, hey, go clean the swamp. Yeah, you know, and, not, you, can, yeah. and you can clean it when you need it. It's not something that you pre-clean and then somebody else yeah. does it. Everybody yeah. can do it themselves. That's on one side of the story. And to your other question of emerging architectures, right? Mm -hmm. So you're going to see an explosion of applications developed from folks who may not necessarily be traditionally called application developers. Yeah. That's really the white place we are seeing emerging. Yeah. Because one of the applications we already deployed with a security company is they have gobs and gobs of structured information about everybody's uh, security profiles. Yeah. But then when somebody asks a very natural language -y question of, hey, how many of my instances are open to the internet? Yeah. Yeah. Trying to find the exact information yeah. in the right table is the connection yeah. that LLM actually enabled to do. And our platform is going and doing them where you can improve the number of relevant responses by not yeah. just 5%, 10%, but by an order of magnitude. I mean, your point, and everything's being smarter. Does, does this software work with this cluster? Yes or no? I mean, this is stuff that's going to be figured out on the yeah. fly. I mean, smart data, everything's getting smarter and productive yes. if the data is smart. 
if you got clean data or, or, or so using here, the data? What's your take on this whole So that's another big paradigm change that's going on, right? So in fact, we are um, trying to get that into a lot of the enterprises as well. The notion of I need to have perfectly clean data before I can go do something is slowly going away, right? Mm -hmm. You, of course, need high quality data, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you need highly structured quality data, mm -hmm. right? If you feed it bad information, don't yeah. get me wrong, it's going to get junk out. But if you have information that is highly unstructured, yeah. you can use an LLM to actually get your answers <laughs> much, much faster. This is like the classic learning machine concepts back in the day. Yeah. If you have enough core data that seeds out the concept, yes. you can figure out and, and infer and train out the bad data. Yes, so we are seeing uh, two uh, things emerge, right? So the, there was a study that just got concluded by BCG and Wharton and a few other uh, teams as well. Mm -hmm where if you give this piece of technology to experts, mm -hmm. like real experts, they actually go much, much faster. You give it to folks who are in the middle of the pack, right? so they're not experts yet, but they're also not newbies. They also do really well because they have discerning capability. You have to be really careful how you give it to people who are really new to the field. Because what happens is they get an over-reliance on these tools before they develop a discerning capability yeah. for themselves, and that can get very dangerous, because yeah. then you don't know whether uh, the thing is giving you good answers or bad answers, you don't know if it's grounded or not. There, the experiment that was conducted was, even if you simply ask yeah. the question, have you thought about the answer that came back, yes or no, in every answer that they're submitting back, changes the mindset completely. Okay, the question, yeah. my question is burning for me is, can I get my hands on the software? Absolutely. So, uh, the <laughs> how much is it going to cost me? Is it going to break the bank? Is it no, can the no. cube afford it? Absolutely. Or small, but you know, small. Yeah, company. yeah. So absolutely. So the affordability. It's not for the rich. This is a democratized. It's thing. a democratized platform for us. Really, in the early days for us, we are more interested in getting into specific verticals and showing a big difference, Got it. rather than actually making a massive profit in the beginning, right? And the reason we are doing that also is, we are truly wanting to solve the toughest problems in every industry. Yeah. And the reason for that also is that's what is the most sustaining. Mm -hmm. If I go after a customer success use case, which is very useful, yeah, yeah. there are 100 players doing that, yeah. and they'll probably do it better. We don't need another Grammarly. We don't need another word processing. Yeah, they do it well. Aspect. What they do is yeah, they got uh, they that do nailed. It. They got that nailed. You can have that. But the the harder problems are what needs to get yeah. solved right now, and that's yeah. really what I our think, course I is. think the domain-specific data that drives yeah. real, unique questions that right. could have reasoning answers to them. Yes. That uses retrieval and data effectively yes. is going to, where the value is going to shift. That's in the specialty models. Yes. That will be part of the training apparatus and the meshing and the, yes. the interaction. Interactions, right? I mean, like yeah. just to give you an example, even if you go on a website, we have a very, very large financial services customer mm -hmm. use case. We have a, a small startup, but it's a, a, a very successful security startup. Yeah. as a use case as a customer. We also have a large government as a customer already using it. So it's as diverse as it gets, and it's yeah. really around uh, us going into fields that we think the problems are hard enough to solve. We tend yeah. to run into tough problems. Arun, great to see you, and it's exciting to see. When I saw the announcement, I saw you on there, I was like, wow, okay, I now I know why we were so exciting to have you on theCUBE uh, on SuperCloud, and it's a great opportunity. I think you're going to see some things emerge I think it's going to be a real accelerant uh, for people to get up and running. Again, in all these inflection points, the simple equation is reducing the steps it takes to do something, yeah. make it simple, fast, and easy to use and intuitive. Yes. You and, do that, that's a affordable. winning formula. And make it affordable. Affordable, yeah, that's, a, that's, a tr that's independent of product. You yes. do those, that's a utility. That's right. We're in a market of scale and, and speed. Yeah. Um, sounds like a great product. Um, just final note here, put a plug into what you're working on. What's your plans for the next year? Obviously you get the funding, independent companies, so you don't have, you know, have a, you, know, you don't have the real purse strings of Intel, but they're not going to let you go under, but you're not like an Intel company. You're independent, you're on your own. Yes. What are your goals? What are you looking to hire? What's your objectives? Absolutely, right? So our objective really is to go after specific verticals and make a big impact in each of those verticals, right? So, um, and the verticals I'm talking about really are also all um, on our website, but really we're going after, of course, a government is a large space, um, financial services is a large space, Aerospace is another large space. Uh, we're getting into uh, telecommunications and of course, semiconductor because of where we come from. And in each of these places, it's really around showing that it can be done. Mm -hmm. The toughest problems can be solved in a meaningful way mm -hmm. and in a way where the customers can get business outcomes quickly. 
that's really what I would consider success. Scale is something we will continue to scale. Um, and as a, an early stage startup, we'll continue yeah. to double or triple. That's just uh, in the DNA of And of course, itself. Intel, a motivated third party, you get more workloads in the AI workloads Absolutely. in the cloud, more chips to make it go faster. Yes and scale up with the performance. In fact, that's one of the biggest pitch. We actually have already started uh, getting customers to start using massive amounts of accelerators that they would have never used before because we put them in production, right? It's not just about a research team going and doing a, an experiment, it's in production. Very different class of use cases. The app development market in AI is going to surge on the big topic up and down the stacks from super chips to super apps, got super cloud, super on-premise. Um, super exciting, Arun, great, great to see you. And thanks for coming, and again, congratulations on the entrepreneurial venture. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Out in the Wild, <laughs> you know, no cover, yeah. you know, Ab execute. Absolutely, yeah. John, thank you so much for having me, and uh, you've always been a pleasure to talk to, and yeah. this has been yeah. a fascinating conversation, thank, thank you. Yeah, great, great, super important. This AI trend is continuing to innovate and create an opportunity for entrepreneurs and businesses to create an environment where more intelligence and productivity will help humans and society, and this is the good side of uh, AI. We're going to let it run. Of course, in the queue, we're always interested. Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll talk to you soon.